me llaman a la torre, así me llamo yo. Okay, now we have to do it again. Yeah, kid. Welcome, welcome, everybody, back to the retake because I am an asshole and I just went on a 15-minute tear with Beth who was crushing it. And then Maddie's sitting there watching the whole thing unfold and I forgot to hit the record button. So with that said, I'm your host, Charles Weinraub, a.k.a. the Handsome Home Buyer, a.k.a. Captain Permit, a.k.a. El Judío Maravilloso. All right, and on the topic of Maravilloso, Mike, the administrative handsome man who's running Captain Permit, is also Maravilloso. 516-513-883. If you need plans, if you need permits, you need help with the building department, if you need questions, if you need a handsome jack man to just look at for a few minutes, (laughs) give us a call. Stop by the office, 516-513-8838. If you have a house... That smells like cat pee, is dated from the 1960s, has six inches of mold on the wall, human waste running past the basement steps. I'm your guy. It's Girl Power Week. We've had three girls on, high power women on the last three episodes. It is fire in the room, like I said before, but I'll say it again, trying to be authentic, primarily because we don't have AC in this room, but mostly because Beth Lowe is on the podcast today, people. <laughs> Beth Lowe. You have a house that went on fire, you want to call me. 516-513. Nope, that's Captain. 516-777 sold. So Beth is a longtime friend who has amassed an unbelievable amount of success in the real estate world. She has a crazy story, which we just heard five minutes of, which now we have to redo <laughs> because I can't hit the play button. But to give you the highlights, and there's many, but we'll we'll keep it short for the purposes of uh, the podcast, which is she is the current YPN president and doing an unbelievable job. I would argue to say, and this is no disrespect to any past presidents, she's the best of the best. The parties, everything, the sponsors, off the charts. Sponsor of the year. Sponsor of the year, sitting here, captain permit, gotta love them, <laughs> right? You, uh, you can't beat it. They're at the best places with the best people. They are literally must be at events. Like when I'm not there, like I wasn't there on Tuesday because I had to do a presentation for school and I'm like, fuck. I'm missing. It's a good one. It's on the water. It's on the beach. Everyone's sexy, dressed <laughs> up, right? And I'm just like, I'm I'm in I'm, I'm in, in school. Class. It sucks. <laughs> Current YPN president, eight years running, exit corp, international top 100, Riz Media list of rising stars, YPN top 20 under 40, top 10 in every category for exit New York Metro. My friend, my lunch buddy, <laughs> Beth Love. And we're not allowed to talk about anything we talk about at lunch. Well, yes. <laughs> lunch, you know, the lunch thing has become like, we talked about this, like a thing. Yeah, it's like a thing. Like people want to go to lunch with us. Yeah. But like, it's like a vault. They can't come. Yeah, people have, um, you know, people are like, yo, that's awesome. Like, how did, how did you ever like get that going? It's like, what do you mean, how did I get that going? Like, eating, <laughs> I'm hungry, you're lunch? hungry, Femi's hungry. Yeah, we go to like lunch. the three of us, I want in on that. Like, how do I get on that? It's like, I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Like, just, it's <laughs> like, find, find your friends and go to lunch. <laughs> yeah, find two people that you like and you want to hang out with and, and just and just go get lunch. Call me, ask me to go get lunch. Ba- Bam. It's really not that complicated. <laughs> That's what I, so I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna give everybody a little bit, because everyone's like, you know, you're, you're like the untouchable Beth Lowe, you know this, right? Like, you have this, like, I'm a regular girl. goddess type of presence <laughs> in the real estate where, like, people are like, how do you know Beth Lowe? I'm like, what do you mean, <laughs> how do I know Beth Lowe? I'm like, all right, you this is- me. Yes, yes, 100%. <laughs> This is ex- don't get any ideas, please don't stalk me. This I is exactly what I did, people. This was in the earlier days. So I'm like, oh, Beth Lowe is the top. I looked, I saw the list of top 20 under 40, and I was like, all right. So then I like weave my way into their lives in a not so creepy <laughs> social media way, where I was like, oh, let me friend all these people on Facebook. And then I guess I reached out to you. I would like to think that I said something charismatic and charming to the point where you're like, yeah, I'll I'll meet you for coffee to discuss business. What the hell did I say to you? I don't Do you know. remember? I don't remember. I mean, it had to be something sort of decent. Otherwise, I'll buy every listing you have. I mean, I don't know what, what you Whatever said. works. Whatever you said, it worked. The important thing is that it worked. And we met at Starbucks and we we spoke about, uh, or I, you sat there with this look of like, <laughs> kind of like, is this guy fucking nuts? Or like, is this okay for like 40, okay? 45 minutes? As I discussed internet dating. Yes, we did discuss internet dating. <laughs> the entire time. He was like, well, your profile has to be like this. And I go out on 100 dates a week. It's a numbers <laughs> game, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like... <laughs> it's a volume business. You got to make volume offers to get product. You got to make volume offers to get girls. It, whatever, whatever works. That was a different time in my life. I was a completely different man. 
That's not important. What is important, people, is if you want to meet somebody like Beth Lowe, not Beth Lowe because I've already, she's hip to this, <laughs> weave your way in a not so creepy way into their life via social media and then find out something that they might be interested in, which, well, I was interested in internet dating. So that's how this <laughs> all came to play. So to go back to what we were just talking about before is Beth has an unbelievable story of like just unbelievable lows to like crazy highs and everything in between. And um, it's really, it really serves, in my opinion, as, as motivation to many people. You know, women, men, whatever country, whatever nationality, whatever color, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of people out there that have excuses for success, for why they're not successful. Right, right? true. And for you to tell the story, which you will in a minute, of where you came from in the process of how you went from there to being one of the top agents on Long Island and being like in the who's who of, of Long Island real estate is, is nothing short of spectacular. But I like people to hear it this way they can kind of identify because there's somebody out there man, woman, child, who's in a similar situation that you were, right, emotionally at that time. And maybe they think, like, they're not able to do it or what's the first step. So, um, and the thing that's even crazier is, on top of it being super emotional, for you it happened when the world was coming to an end. Right. <laughs> in the worst economic time of probably any of our lifetimes ever. So, uh, with that said... Want me to tell the story? Tell the story. Okay, so... Back in September of 2008, like many people, I got fired from my job. Um, I had all my possessions in a box standing in Penn Station, sure, familiar scene at the time. Um, and I called my dad and I told him what happened. And he said, you hated that job. You've been miserable ever since the day you graduated from college. Why don't you figure out what you want to be and be it? So with that being said, I went home, which was another place I also didn't want to be. Um, and I realized that I had basically been kidding myself about what was really going on in my life in pretty much every aspect of it. Um, I realized my husband, who was a mortgage banker, never brought home any money anymore. And he had, actually, that was because he wasn't even going to work anymore. He was getting up every day, putting on a suit, and going doctor shopping for painkillers. So here I was, 30 years old, no job, married, married to a painkiller addict. Um, and things just kind of went south from there. Not that they were good to begin with, they were terrible, but things just kind of rapidly started going downhill. So that was September. The rest of the year was horrific. It culminated on the night of February 2nd, 2009, where I found myself locked in my master bedroom, which luckily had a bathroom, in my apartment. Um, with my with my pets and him trying to break through the door with a knife because he was so high on drugs that he I don't know thought I was trying to attack him or kill him or whatever I became like this monster even though he was the monster so luckily he passed out before anything bad happened I waited till it was daylight sent an email to my dad sent an email to a friend sent an email to his parents letting them know what was going on. Um, I'd gotten a couple emails back. My dad told me to get the fuck out of there. <laughs> he had an appointment for me with a lawyer later that day. My friend told me to pack a bag and come stay with her. And his parents told me, um, no, I was the one with the drug problem, not, not their son. So Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was passed out on the couch. And um, I stepped over the knife that he was using to try to break in the door with a bag full of stuff random stuff and uh, I basically ran down the stairs got in my truck sat there for a minute started crying um it was like a cloudy cold February day like with like a damp rain kind of thing going on and I drove to my friend's house because I knew that was the one place he probably couldn't find me um when he finally woke up later that afternoon he called me and I told him I wasn't coming home and if I thought my life was chaotic Prior to that, <laughs> you have no idea. It became like a lifetime movie of him threatening me and then one minute trying to win me back and the next minute saying, you know, he was going to kill me as soon as he found me. And it was chaos. And I called his parents and I said, look, you got to get your kid into rehab. He has a serious drug problem. He, and then they would call me back and say, well, he, he doesn't have a problem. He's not going. And I was just like, finally, I gave up. It was like a week had gone by, and um, it was a Sunday night. I went to bed, 
shut my phone, put my phone on silent like I always do. Got up at seven o'clock in the morning. Hundreds of missed calls from a few of his friends. And I was like, probably crashed my car again because I was trying to get my car back from him. And uh, no, he, uh, he had actually overdosed and died that night. And um, such a weird range of emotions that you go through and like this guy that's like, threatening your life is like now dead like just a weird like not that many people in this world can probably say they've like experienced that yeah it's like to go from like this high of being like a victim of like abuse and like getting away getting away getting yourself out of there to then like this it was like total total craziness um but at the end of the day his death only served I think to motivate me more because there were so many things that he said I couldn't do like he said I could never be a real estate agent uh you know he said I could never survive on my own that I couldn't take care of myself and I think that really became my why and that really is what motivated me to say like I'm never gonna need a man to take care of me I'm never you know I'm never gonna find myself in a place where I can't take care of myself and you know all of these things really pushed me and motivated me um to get my real estate license, which was like, everyone was like, you're getting your real estate license in 2009. <laughs> Why don't you just apply for food stamps now? Like, this is a terrible time. And I didn't really listen to anyone because I didn't really have anything left to lose at that point. Like, I was basically homeless living on like, in a friend's house. I was like 200 to $250,000 in debt. I owned a Mustang that I couldn't even drive because I couldn't even drive stick. Like. There was just so many factors of like, what what am I what do I have to lose by becoming a real estate agent? And I think, you know, that that power of broke, that like power of not having anything left to lose is powerful for that reason, you know? So I just went out and did it. I got my real estate license. I went out. It took me a few months to actually like physically get started because I still have all these thoughts in my head that everyone else has. It's just a matter of squashing them and getting past them and saying like I can do this. And what do I have to lose? Like, seriously, sit there and say, well, what do I have to lose if I try this? What am I really going to lose? Probably nothing. And I was like, I can't can't become a real estate agent because I don't have any money. And I'm like, well, I don't have any money because I don't have a job. So why don't I just go become a real estate agent? I could have no money and still at least be trying to make money. So it's kind of how it evolved. And I, I got my first job in real estate. And I sold a house in my first open house. So that fueled me. But then I didn't sell another house for four months. And everyone called me a one-hit wonder. So I had to deal with all that. You know, it was just always like a series of like... Wait, people say that in real estate? You're a one-hit wonder in real estate? People were like mad that I sold a house right away. And then like it took me four months to sell another one. So I ended up leaving that company because it wasn't... It just wasn't for me. The guy just wasn't for me. And when I left him, he told me no one would ever give me a listing. Like, I just have all these people always tell What the f- Someone told me I couldn't be YPM president. Tell me, tell me I can't do something, please. Tell me, because I will turn around and do it 20 million times better than I ever thought was possible. It's, it seems to be a motivating factor for me. So I got, I left there. I went right to exit. Uh, no one had even heard of exit. Now we're like in the top 1% of all brokerages in Suffolk County. Uh, no one had ever heard of us at the time. I was the fifth agent that my broker hired. I'm the only original one still there. Nine wow. years later. She's amazing, by the way. She's you should have her on. I love her. Like You she, should have her on. I will have you her need on to have though. Susan on your podcast for sure. Would she do it? Um, I think she would do it. She is awesome. I like um, she's so inspirational and like you did I'm you not just, gonna did you just do her. did you just do the um like the trip where they went where you guys did the whole Yeah, like, where I didn't want to go lip zip lining until uh her did, partner Elta told me I I <laughs> Yes, that I had to go. And did then, you go? Yeah, I went on the course three times. Was it I had awesome? the time of my life. Yeah, it was freaking amazing. <laughs> yeah. But like, what brokers? I mean, I mean, you said so much. There's so much stuff I want to touch on. But I guess with that first, like, there's so many brokers out there not giving any value. Like, I feel like 99% of brokers just suck. Like, well, I think she... they're in it for the wrong reasons. Like, Susan's not in this to make money. Yeah. She's not. Like, that's not what motivates her in by any stretch. No, I believe that. But being a broker is actually very hard because if you want to be. There's like, there's brokers out there that are selling real estate. That's not, like, that's not being a broker in my opinion. No, I agree with you. Like, I wouldn't work for a broker who sold. Yeah, like, if when you become a broker, you're in the business of cultivating and managing and uplifting agents. Right. It's a completely different skill set than the skill set that I have, in my opinion. Like, I have a different skill set. 
it's more to go out and sell houses. She's running an office. Like to me, just because I'm good at selling real estate doesn't interchange that automatically. And I think what happens is you have a lot of top producers opening their own office. Yeah. And it's two it's not different skill sets. She's, she's like a mother. She's a nurturer. She's yes. a kindergarten teacher sometimes. Yes. Like there's a lot I that goes it. into it. Like when I left your office the other day, I guess someone had gotten into a car accident. Did yes. you see that? Yes. And she like sat there with them probably for like hours, like holding their hands. Like that's, that's really who she is. That's really who she is. That's what I'm saying. So it's, it's, and listen, and I would argue to say, I mean, there are some brokers that make a shit ton of money, right? Like New York City, whatever. But like, I would argue to say that the average Long Island broker, like you can make a lot more money being a top agent than you can being a broker on Long Island. I think it's easier to make money yes. being a top agent than with, to be a broker for sure. Way less responsibility. Right. Way less aggravation. Right. Way much less bullshit. People are like, when are you going to open your own office? I'm like, well, can I open an office for X, whatever I give my broker a year? Because <laughs> I don't so, even think I could turn the lights on for that or that have a, pay the rent for that or have someone answer the phones for that like there's so many costs that go into it see and the very cool thing about you and I, I this speaks to a your character right and then be the kind of person that she is which is this like you're Beth Lowe. so for, for all intents and purposes <laughs> Just a regular girl you're Beth Lowe. <laughs> so I can I don't know this firsthand but I can I can guess that you've had a tremendous amount of offers from other brokers to leave yes. right like and I, I'm sure those offers had a lot of zeros in them I'm sure. Um, but you don't do that. No. You, no. I've had some ridiculous offers over the years. I'm sure. And I mean, it just makes sense. For me as a business person, that makes sense. You know, but when you look at it, you know, all right, so someone's going to give me X amount of dollars up front, hundreds of thousands sometimes. And I think I look at what exit and what Susan give me, and there's, there's no long, you know, it's just, why would I leave there? I have a supportive office. Supportive office staff, a spot for me and my assistant doesn't cost me any money. Um, anytime I need something, she's there. Yeah. She knows. She never. She always has my back, and and she doesn't bother me. She's not like, are you really wearing jean shorts today? Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I'm really wearing jean shorts today. Like, she doesn't say that. We're like, I come in in my gym clothes because my day got messed up. Like, yeah. she doesn't care that I'm in the office in my gym clothes. There's places that wanted to hire me that told me I had to get dressed up every day. And I'm like, I'm going to show Handsome a house filled with sewage. Yes. I don't need to be wearing no. an Armani suit today. No. This job to me does not you require don't, don't need getting dressed up. You you know, don't need like, I'm that. like down and dirty, walking through backyards. You know, I mean, I don't really need uh -huh. to like be dressed to the nines for that. See, the grass is not always greener. And the no, interesting thing definitely that, not. The interesting that I started, maybe it's because I've been around for a couple of years now, so I'm getting it. So you'd be able to comment on this better than me. Like, the real estate brokerage industry, in my opinion, is kind of turning into the fitness industry in the sense that it's becoming very fatty. And what I mean by that is like, you know, CrossFit comes out or like this comes out or right. Peloton comes out. Now it's like this brokerage comes out. Right. Everyone goes, go here. Everyone go jumping. there. So now it's like, now it's EXP is like this yeah. whole thing. And it's like, guys, like the grass isn't. It's not, always, you know, it, it isn't, I don't think. And I, I think, you know, if someone calls you and you're just going to leave where you are because of that. That's just like weird to me. Like, if I'm gonna leave exit, like I'm gonna sit down probably with you, Femi, a bunch of other people, formulate a plan. Like, I'm not just gonna go. Exp called me today. I'm out the door. You know, yeah. like that's like this is a business. They're gonna like, give me stock, even though I don't really know exactly what that means. Like whatever it they're is. They're gonna give me a profit share. You know, like yeah. I'm 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 like a very much of it's not broken, don't fix it. If something yeah. happened. It would have to be something like catastrophic and dramatic, but like I'm not just gonna like no. run out the door because someone called me and said, "Oh, we'll give you this or we'll give you that." That's that's not running a business to me. For for all the brokers that are out there, or for the people that are thinking about becoming brokers, from your standpoint of of, of who you are, because I think a lot of people don't ask people like you this question, which is, as an agent, as a top producing agent, what do you like to like? What's important to you in a brokerage, and then what does your like? From just like a standpoint of who she is, what makes your broker so special? You know what I'm saying? Okay. So what what's important to me in a broker? What, yeah, what's like as as a top agent, what is important to you as a broker? You can mend meld yeah, those like two it's together. Kind of, to me it's kind of like a balance of letting me do my thing but having my back when I need you to have my back, when I have a problem, when I need help with something. But not micromanaging me to death, telling me what I need to wear, what I need to do and all that stuff. It's Really, for me, it's kind of having the freedom to run my business. Like, I want to run it. 
obviously ethically, morally within the, you know, confines like of, you know, all the rules that we have, but also like not being mad at me if I run into the office in my gym clothes, which I know there's a lot of places where you you would get in trouble for that or you wouldn't get a lead for that. And that's like it's crazy to really? me. Really? Like, yeah. The f- craziness. That's like And like Susan, um, She's, you know, she's kind of like, uh, you know, like a little bit of like a mom to me. You know, my mom passed away 15 years ago and, you know, Susan just always, she doesn't ask me if I sold anything that day when I see her. She asks me, how are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, sometimes like, you know, I think most people probably don't know I have type 1 diabetes. So like, oh, if I really? don't show up. I didn't know that. You didn't? How do you not because know that? Because you didn't share that with me. Well, I just shared it with everyone now. So, um... <laughs> I mean, I've shared it. I've shared it when I when I speak. I generally share it. I was just one of the other that things that happened thing? to me in the last ten years. Um, thirty, yeah, like probably seven is years that, ago. I don't know a lot of. Is that very severe, or it could be monitored with diet? Like, what is? No, that? it can't be monitored. Do you need diet. insulin? Yes, you need, I take insulin. You prick your finger. Yes. Wow. Yeah, you don't tell me <laughs> anything. Like I think we're friends. <laughs> I don't, you know what? I don't like lead with it. I'm wow. like, hi, I'm Beth. I'm type one diabetic. No, hi, I'm Beth, superstar realtor. You take you take insulin? Yeah, multiple times a day. Wow. Holy yeah. shit! This, see, this is why you do the repeat podcast because crazy <laughs> stuff comes out on the podcast. So like, you know, Susan like checks in. Like, if I don't like, if like I'm not there, and maybe she's like worried about me, she'll just call me and just be like, Are you okay? Is everything okay? You know, she was there when I got diagnosed. She came to the hospital. She got. She was there before my dad even got there, obviously, because my dad lives in Florida. So yeah, she's like a she's like a mom to me. Like, and everyone in my office kind of feels that way. Whether they sell one house a year or fifty houses a year, she's just. You know, someone calls her Big Mama. She's just like a. She's not big, by the way. She's, <laughs> she's lost a ton of weight. She looks amazing. Um, she's just like. There's no one that could replace her to me. You know, she's like a special person. Wow. So if you're thinking about recruiting Beth Lowe, stop. <laughs> don't even call just me, stop. please. Just don't. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you. Susan's my mom. Yeah, <laughs> I'm that's not, it. I'm not going Done. anywhere. <laughs> Done. Not going to happen. Not happening. Don't even. Don't so, call me. No one has called me. In, like, no one real has called me in a while. I think everyone got the message. Did um did the diabetes, when did that when did that happen? Like Just any, when I started to become successful. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, all around the same time. 2000 and... 11, 12. So take us through kind of like the progression of like, so everyone's telling you, no, you can't do it, which is awesome. Yes. Like, so I'm going to say like, no, you can't date a Jewish man. <laughs> Who's bald. <laughs> and let's see what happens. Flips houses. No. <laughs> <laughs> no lunch talk. No lunch talk. You're breaking your own rules. <laughs> oh, I'm, all right. You... Um, so I'm curious to know, like, just to tell people again, like how, how that process keeps going. Like, Everyone's saying you can't do it. You start to get a little bit of traction, but that's not like that's not you at the level that you're at right now. Like this, it's a process. Like people look at you and they're like, "Oh, Beth, this is great. I want to be like a realtor that sells fifty plus houses a year." But like, you know, what does it take? It takes fucking blood. It takes everything. Yes, it take it actually almost killed me. So my first year, I sold twenty seven houses with Exit, and I ended up getting type one diabetes, which obviously is sometimes caused by stress. At that at that age, I was like thirty three or somewhere around there. So, I mean, that could have derailed me altogether. So I sold, I was working like 12 hours a day, probably like plus weekends bartending. And then I was getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier and skinnier, skinnier. I was like down to like 95 pounds. I'm like 132 pounds today, which is like pretty normal for me. So this minus like 35 pounds yeah, is no. scary, Yeah. <laughs> scary skinny. And, um... Yeah, so I kind of like worked myself almost to death and I think that's why I have a better like mentality about it and when I see young agents now like bragging about how they never take a day off, I'm like, got to take a day off. Yeah. You got to make it a priority. I talked about it on Dan O'Neill's podcast a little bit, like making appointments with yourself. Okay. Like, do you take a day off? Do you have a day off every week that you take off? Not necessarily, but like But you do a lot of things for I, yourself. Yes. You take care of yourself. Yes. You do. Um Something that I've been kind of like, I guess I realized not that long ago that I've been talking about a lot is um, how like gut-wrenching, horrible moments in your life, the aftermath of that is something amazing. So, and I kind of feel bad for people that, I think there's a lot of people that kind of like hover in this zone of like not rock bottom or not super stressful, which I actually feel bad for them 
people would think I'm nuts by saying that. But no, rock bottom is the best place you can be. Only when you are like just completely. When you have pinned. nothing left to lose. When you are pinned, that's the name of the podcast, by the way. I wrote it down. Nothing left to lose. <laughs> um, only when you are like back to the you know back to the wall, lower than low, stressed out, like you know having health problems as a result of your stress, can you then like elevate to a crazy level. I think so. I think it's important. I think it's important. I and mean, your rock bottom doesn't maybe have to be as horrible as my rock bottom is. You yeah, know? That's crazy. Like, no, yeah. I hope it's not right, but like, I just hope that like, I think yeah. I think too be too many people just live in their comfort zone though. I think that's the problem. They just don't that's even just, let like I don't know. They just hover. You're right. They like hover. Yeah, and, and you can't get greatness out of hovering. No, like they're unhappy, but they're not unhappy enough, enough to make a yeah. change. So they kind of just like accept it, and, and then like years go by. Yeah. Like, literally years go by, and you haven't done what you wanted to do in life. God, that's sad. Very sad. I, so I take, I, like, all of my issues that I've gone through over that life any day. No, it's, um, life is about the ride, and it's beautiful. And, like, it's not always, like, sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes it's shit, but, like, you need shit to grow, uh, what? Think of something. Whatever. Doesn't I don't matter. know. You get the point. Yeah, it's like fertilizer. You, you get the point. Yeah. <laughs> so, um... I want to talk about you and your marketing because, well, I guess another theme of who you are, which you probably know this, but is that you're always, <coughs> you're basically always doing what everybody else isn't doing. So like you are always running into the fire. <laughs> what I mean by that is like you went into real estate when everyone's like, what are you doing? You were like doing a lot of social media stuff when it wasn't like super popular. Right. You were doing like short sales and things like that when like that was when nobody had an understanding of it. Right. Et cetera. So like you're a lot of who you are and how you grew your businesses by going against the grain of. Right. I never do anything the easy way. <laughs> yeah. It's just boring. <laughs> yeah. But is it, is this like innate? Is this something like innate about you that makes you do like what makes you do that? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I just, <laughs> like, I, well, I started doing short sales because people needed my help and I was able to empathize with them because I had gone through so much shit. So I wasn't coming in there and treating them like people who weren't paying their mortgage. I was treating them like people who needed help. And, yeah. you know, so I, that was just, I think, an easy transition for me because, hey, the market was in that place. So imagine I went in in 2009 and 10 and decided to sell luxury real estate. <laughs> I don't think I'd be sitting here today, yeah. right? So I looked at what the market trends were, whether I realized it or not. I think yeah. I do a lot of things and I don't realize what I'm doing them yeah, like until after the fact where like you can put a name on it. Like I, I basically invented organic social media marketing, but yeah. five years later, all these people are selling classes for like $5,000 yeah. on how to do what I did in 2009. It's like, for, then, for those of you who like don't follow uh, or are friends with her on Facebook, like they cap you at the five thousand. Yeah, so. I just deleted a bunch of people, so I have some room. I know you have a cleansing, <laughs> like a yearly cleansing, but like it's the craziest thing to watch. So I used to joke with Beth when I first met her all the time. Like you go on Beth's Facebook, and she would like post something like, as let's say it's like just super basic. Like the sky is blue. All of a sudden, there's. 3,000 comments of, yes, the sky is blue. It's the most beautiful blue. It's actually a hue of navy today. Like, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, the amount of interaction you have with people via social media is crazy. And it's just really me being myself. Yeah. yeah. It's not like, I get a lot of business from Facebook. And that was never my intention when I started posting about it. But it's kind of like what happened. So I cultivated it, which is organic social media marketing now. Yes. <laughs> now, nine years later, we have a nine, name for it. Nine years later. <laughs> um, a thing that you had mentioned before, and I actually wrote down, so I didn't say it, which was you are, um, you are very, you are genuinely caring and very supportive to other agents. And I had wrote that down about you, like when we were just sitting here bullshitting before, because it was something I wanted to make sure I touched on. But you touched on it. But I think that's, I think that's very important for people to know and understand. Like, A, a lot of people could see you and you're, you're, you're a powerful woman, right? Like, you're an independent, powerful woman. And you are, you're tough. Hey. Like, I know you. <laughs> like, I, I know different sides of you. Like, I know you as very tough, but I also know you as very sensitive. And the cool thing about you is it's like, all right, if, if you're in the circle that is Beth Lowe's world, she'll, like, stab somebody in the eye with her Lubitin for you, right? <laughs> you know, if you're not, you're not. You're still always very respectful, but you are very welcoming and uplifting to agents of all kinds yes and you've always given back 
and I think that's very important and probably a big reason why you're as successful as you are. Thank you. You like that, huh? Yeah, wow, that was so nice. That was, that was, that was so nice. <laughs> Um, you are very also you're like you're unbelievably involved which is very important like you're so you have the organic you created organic social media marketing <laughs> contrary to popular opinion and um, but you're I mean you have like guerrilla marketing like your your networking is off the charts like you are lobbying you are YPN you and is our what's our pack our pack is the realtors political action Committee. okay that's what you're involved in also. yes that's that's the lobby like you do you're fucking everywhere everywhere um I guess kind of explain about how important that is because I see the people that I see everywhere like the ASOF Germans of the world the U's like these are the people that are making it happen and this takes work and time and sacrifice and it's not all sunshine and rainbows like Meaning, we give up as people that were like you, myself, Aesop, etc. Like we give up a lot to go for what we want. So I guess kind of speak about that in all aspects of how important is networking. What was your strategy? And then like it's not all sunshine and rainbows. No, I mean it's definitely not all sunshine and rainbows. And there's you know, it does take a lot of time, and there are sometimes things that you know get sacrificed to do these things. But you know, I think once you get to a certain level, these things become second nature to you. Like, to me, like, why wouldn't I go and lobby? Because these are things that are affecting my clients, and that's just very much who I am as a person. So if there's laws and changes coming down, I'm not just going to sit back and complain about them on Facebook. I'm going to go to Albany. I'm going to go to D.C. And, and lobby on our behalf. And that was something that going to Lobby Day with the Long Island Board of Realtors for the first time really pushed me to get more involved. It was just getting that little taste of being able to affect change. Someone like Asaf wants to change things, wants to do good in the world. My broker, Susan, she wants to change things. She wants to do good in the world. My avenue for changing things and doing good is through lobbying for the rights of Long Island homeowners and, you know, trying to help make, you know, the board of realtors run the way that, you know, we think it should run, you know, so the, the only way to do that is to get involved. I can't do that sitting on Facebook making comments because that's just not going to get anything done. There's a time, kind of a time and a place for everything. And I just think network is, networking is important for whatever business that you're in. The more people you know, the better off you are. It's, it's that simple. And that's how the referral business uh, flows. And if you want to have business, you have to do that. Yeah, I canceled Zillow today because I don't need it. Wow. It's huge. Wow. That's huge, right? That is huge. I've, yeah. Let me, um, I want to talk to you about a strategy. I posted something about this the other day because a lot of people have been commenting on it is, um, volume versus price point right and you're just opinion on this so and then i guess this also comes down to like what your why is and what you like and who the kind of people you like working with so with certain like just to kind of talk about like the difference between selling you know 20 1.5 million dollar houses or selling tw like 30 400 thousand dollar houses or like how you blend the two together as a strategy, you know what I mean? Like, is it better for certain, like, what do you like better? Do you think it's better if certain agents focus on a different higher point or a certain market type, or how do you feel about it in general? Um, I think it's really hard to just say I only work in one price market. I mean, there are years I've sold a co-op for 120000 and a house for a million bucks. You know, it's kind of it is what it is but for me like and most people tell you the bread and butter is somewhere between four and six hundred thousand first time home buyer houses okay that's really like if you're just starting out i think the best thing that you can do and this is what i did but this kind of just happened on its own was most of my clients it was 2010 11 12 they were buying their first houses so I, even though i did listings my main focus was that i mean it was buyer's market back then right so if you had a lot of listings and there were days where I had like 27 listings and none of them were selling and I need to, I would like die to have 27 listings today at one time. But not really because when you think about it, I had 27 listings because they weren't selling <laughs> because yeah. that was the market. Yeah. No. You know, so I worked with a lot of buyers back then and then those buyers have now become my sellers. So if you don't get that cycle right in the uh, beginning. That's interesting. Like I actually kind of like. I think a lot of people starting today who maybe went heavy into listings, because that's what a lot of brokerages tell you, including my own. But I was going to ask you about that. That's like a, to me, that's like a, it's a kind of like a gap. So most people who are selling, 
are not trading up and staying, right? The majority, I would say, are moving or downsizing for the most part. Like, I have most of, like, the people, like, our parents' age, they're leaving New York. So, say your parents' friends refer you, they're all moving to North Carolina. Well, now you don't have that. So, but if you started out with, like, 10 of your friends who were buying their first house, five to seven years, they're going to buy their next house, and they might not even buy another house after that. So, a majority of my business now is repeat business. Okay. And then those first time home buyers referred their friends who were first time home buyers. And only recently did I start doing like the trade up. Trade up didn't really happen for me. Well, in 2010, 11, and 12, most people didn't have any equity to trade up. Yeah, no. I think it took to 2014 for me to have my first positive equity conversation on a listing appointment. Wow. That's nuts. But think about when I started. That was a crazy time. It was a crazy time. Like, so if you're starting now, some of the things, you're probably doing different things than me. It'd be interesting to take, like, a Dan O'Neill and see in five years where his business is because he's done a lot of listings. But, you know, the first time home buyers are just, that that was just so key for me back then. And it was easy because you could make an offer, a $300,000 house, you could offer two fifty, dollars and you'd probably get it. Yeah. <laughs> like now you'd have to offer three fifty dollars to get it. Pretty much. Just it was a different time. So I don't know. I always think first-time home buyers, though, just like you use that strategy for the houses you flip. Yeah. I don't think you could ever go wrong with first-time home buyers. Yeah, no, it's, it's like, like you said, it's the bread and butter aspect of it. For me, it's like, but for me, like I'm, I'm, the issue I'm having with it now is that it's, it could get exhausting from an investment standpoint. To it like, could be an exhausting standpoint from a real estate agent because now you're working all it's volume. You're working all weekend. Yeah. I there were days where I probably showed fifty houses between Saturday and Sunday. Like I don't really do that anymore because I'm more of like a listing agent now, yeah. or I do mostly trade up. I very rarely have true first time home buyers, and if I do, I don't have fifteen of them at once like I yeah. used to because most of, most people that I know, most people my age, are now in their late thirties, early forties. I've kind of, my business has kind of grown with my early clients. Yeah. Like a majority of it. No, that makes sense. So I guess, I mean, really the moral of it all is that you need kind of a healthy mix. Yes. I don't think you could do any one thing. Like, I don't think that's a, that's not a healthy business at all. And uh, I think that's a good strategy, I guess, with, if you're, whether you're selling real estate, if you're an investor, because it's like, all right, if, like right now I'm not buying anything that sells outside of the first time home buyer market. I think you're smart with that. It's just not moving. But now if you're a realtor that's concentrated in doing higher end homes, you're screwed. Right. Like you may be getting listings, but like your listings aren't selling. Right. Like I look up, like I look at obviously the market every day and I'm seeing like higher price stuff and higher price stuff come on. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm not really, I don't know if I'm seeing it move, especially in the Hamptons. Had an interesting conversation with like Piccinini about that, about what he's seeing out there. I love, <laughs> like, I love that kid. He's, a bunch of he's like you're laughing in the background. <laughs> He's a cartoon character. <laughs> He's a good kid. Um, how do you see, like, as far as the market goes, how do you see the recent tax law change affecting the market when you're dealing with your first time home buyers? You know, I haven't seen that segment of the market affected at all. Like, people aren't like, oh, I can only write off $10,000. No, I haven't even heard anyone say that. They'll buy the house that. with 12000 or 13000 Yeah, I haven't heard show. anyone say that at all. I think it's going to affect. The higher end, right. eight hundred plus yeah. second homes in the Hamptons, especially all those new rental laws that just came out. Yeah, with the yeah with the rent stabilized stuff. But yeah, I was just always thinking. I'm like, I was I was wondering. I was like, you know what? Because the lower the first time home buyers, a lot of them are barely making it. Like, they're emptying their bank account to close this deal. But the guy, the people that have the the second houses, their higher end homes. I'm like, do they have the money, or maybe everyone just lives beyond their means? So like, <laughs> well, that could be a deal. You're screwed regardless. <laughs> I don't know. I just, um, I had a listing recently in Port Jeff Station that we just started getting a lot of action on, which is fucking weird. It was on the market for like, awesome house, on the market, three ninety nine, dollars four bedroom, two bathrooms, outside entrance, apartment, like everything done to the nine, sick, three ninety nine, dollars crickets. Like not even showings, and the taxes were at 12 Gs. So I started talking to some of the agents, and they were just like, yo, people are like becoming really tax- Sensitive. Well, those are you, that's high taxes for a four hundred thousand dollar house. Once out you there. cross the, yeah. the ten thousand dollar threshold, people are kind of like, ah. well, I just I think it's like that's kind of like also like an area thing. Like that's kind of three ninety nine Port Jeff Station is also kind of creeping up there. So it's like you probably have less people looking in Port Jeff Station yeah. that price. It was weird. Like so, I, so I did the numbers in that area just to see, 
I think it was a ton of comps to support at that and even higher. I even talked to Dan O'Neill. He's like, bro, this thing's going to sell at like 429 And then I looked at how much. So there's 2.9 months worth of inventory in Port Jeff Station, which is fucking nothing. Nothing. And the average list price is three ninety nine. So I'm like, perfect. What the hell? <laughs> what the fuck is going on? But for some reason, I guess this happens sometimes. I'm curious to know your experience. There's sometimes I put a house in the market and it's like feeding frenzy. Then there's sometimes you put a house in the market and it's almost like you need like a seasoning period. Yes, where like it's, it's, I've seen that lately too. It's weird. Like sometimes I sell something in 48 hours and then sometimes, like I have this one house in North Belmore. It was a feeding frenzy at first. Then it was nothing worked out. Then it was dead, dead, dead. Then it was a feeding frenzy again a few weeks ago. I accepted an offer. It's a fully under contract now. And ever since like the minute I accepted the offer to yesterday, it was like... Calls, con- constant calls, constant calls. So it was just like weird. It's weird. I don't know. I have some houses that, are, please show them. Like I'm just like, what is going on? It's just you know, but they're higher end. It's higher, yeah, it's higher end higher stuff. stuff. You know what I hate also, which is kind of weird, which people seem to be doing a little bit more now, is um, like there are certain houses where I'll get like the most ever was I did a house in Uniondale. I had fifteen accepted offers that fell through. Like, well, I, I a think lot of it becomes like they, buyer's remorse. Right. They freak out. Because now they've lost a bunch of houses. So now they overbid on your house. And then they like, they're like, oh, I don't feel comfortable. And they back out. That happens like all the time. Like an agent from my office just posted, like, uh, we were half in contract and we got a higher offer yesterday. Uh, my client wants to take it. I'm like, well, you should also warn them that that higher offer might vanish yep. instantly, you know, for whatever reason possible, because they bid from an emotional standpoint, not, yep. you know, like the first person who bid from, all right, there's no other offers on this house, blah, 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 blah. Now you're putting someone in a situation where they know there's another offer, they know this is going on. It creates something in their mind yep. where they then overbid past their comfort zone. And I, I've i talked to multiple agents who have been in this situation in the past like year or so, yeah. where then the offer falls through. Yeah, and you know, and it's, you gotta be smart about it. Like I take the first offer, if I get a higher offer, I still take the first offer because You'll always get screwed. I mean, quick story. I had um, I had a piece of property that I wanted to purchase, and it was actually purchased by it was being listed by a broker. Like the broker from a big, well-known brokerage. I've had a number of his agents on the podcast before. Buys this thing from the homeowner for cash, and then relists it to make a quick buck. I gave him full price. He accepted the offer, and then the next day, he's like, "Oh, we just got something twenty thousand dollars higher from an outside agent." I went through one of his own agents. So he was going to keep everything in house, and he and he fucked me. So I shoot him an email and I said, "Listen, at all do at that same day, he had sent everybody in his brokers. He has multiple offices. A podcast of one of his people that was on my podcast, and I and he's like, this is amazing. Look at this guy, blah blah blah.' So I sent him an email. I'm like, "Hi, listen, I'm that guy. I'm promoting <laughs> your agents. I do a lot of work. You accepted my offer. I would appreciate it if you um, if you honored that because it's the right thing to do." And he basically wrote me back and said, "Fuck you." So I'm like, it's okay. I waited a week, called the agent back. I'm like, yo, check up on that. Deal died. Of course it did. It always does. Yeah. So 99% of the time, that higher offer is not going through. So now the offer dies. Your agent thinks you're a piece of shit. I think you're a total asshole. And like, here we are back to where we are before. So it's like, don't do that, people. It's bad business. It's bad. People are. Bad business. I say this all the time. People are stepping over dollars to pick up quarters all the time it's always very short term people like live in business in a very short term right just like people who aren't putting their listings publicly on MLS well just wait till the market changes you're not going to be able to sell everything yourself you're going to need me and now you're getting a reputation as someone I don't want to work with because you're difficult and you only care about yourself because not putting the house on MLS is not the best thing for your client by the way <laughs> see that's a dope point and I'm glad you brought it up because I had Jeff B. Gay said something similar to me about the other day because he was bitching about certain agents that he's like these people suck is um, it's all fine and dandy when the market's awesome. Of course, of course. It's, but when the market it changes, shit, and it's going it's to. It's going to. Right? It might it not is. go back to 2008, yeah. 9, 10 levels, but there's going to be a shift at some point. And, and we all need each other. Right? Right. We have to work together. Everybody knows. So like That's how we became friends. You bailed me out of multiple bad short sale right. situations. It's, uh, you know, it, it's a give and take. We all help each other and it's great. So it's like, you can't think like, oh, it's awesome, fuck everybody else because it, it comes back to, get, everything comes full circle right. all the time. Um, I want to, I have two questions that I want to conclude on. So one is, 
I want your advice to agents of all kinds, whether they be just starting out or, you know, been in the business a couple of years and they're struggling and they're looking to achieve, you know, a similar level to you. What do you recommend for them? I think a lot of it starts in your mind. Like it all really kind of starts up here. Like do you wake up in the morning or you and think negative thoughts? Like I don't allow myself to think negative thoughts. If I even get a negative thought, I make myself say the opposite three times positively. Really? Like this deal's gonna fall apart. No, this not. You're gonna save the deal, you're gonna save the deal, you're gonna save the deal. <laughs> like I don't allow like myself to think negatively and I don't surround myself with negative people. And that goes down to Wow. Where is the brokerage that you're working? Is it a positive, happy place where you want to go every day? Or is it a ghost town with tumbleweeds blowing through? Do they offer you training? Like, if you're struggling, why are you struggling? Do you not know how to do things? Are you not getting support? Are the thoughts in your head negative? Like, there's so many things. Like, who do you surround yourself with? Are, you, are all of your friends complaining about their lives? Or are all your friends trying to achieve greater things? Like, 99% of my friends are trying to achieve greater things. You, Femi, Mark, Kyle. Like, we're all trying to get to the same place. Like, I don't really have negative friends. I don't have friends who, you know, want to sit around and complain all day. Like, that doesn't get you anywhere. You know, just see who you're surrounding yourself with, whether it's your broker, your friends, and even your own thoughts in your head. So, and I'm curious to know, um, and we don't, I don't ask you this at lunch, so uh, <laughs> I'll ask you it here. What's... Uh, what does the future of Beth Lowe look like? What's what's the the, the last ten years have been a, a lifetime movie? Yep. What I'm the, going for Hallmark Channel this time. What what what, are the, what are the next? <laughs> I want to be on the, I want to be a Hallmark Channel movie, <laughs> not, not a lifetime movie. What are the next ten years? It's a it's a good question, and I think people might be surprised or not be surprised by what I want to accomplished but I want I want to be a house flipper like you yeah <laughs> you know I think you know that like, no I know I, you I, know, I know everyone's been running around copying my ideas it's about time I just did my ideas in my own houses <laughs> you know you copy a lot of my I, my style well, that, that, I do Listen. I've had a lot of people copy my style and I'm gonna start profiting off of my nice. you know my love and ability to also design houses I went to FIT this is not like so far out of the realm I didn't know that are we even friends? Because you don't talk Are to me. Are we even friends? You know what it is now that I think about it? It's more like I walk into lunch and I'm like, blah, we dump all this <laughs> and shit. And me and Femi are like, oh my blah. god. <laughs> all right. I'm so, starting to talk more. <laughs> so, so sometimes it takes a form like this yeah. To, to... Yeah, so that's really, that's my passion and that's like my, my love and... You know, I bought the biggest piece of shit house that anyone could have purchased. And someone called it a tiny cape the other day. It's not. A it's tiny. not a tiny cape at all. Yeah, it's a ginormous farm ranch. It might look tiny from the front, but that's kind of one of the things I liked about it. Um, I just like, I can walk into a space and I see it as what it can be, not as what it is. So most people thought I was crazy when I bought that house. And it's a dope house. It's a really, it's a cool house. I'm going to, I'm going to miss it when I sell it. And, and that in itself is a skill. Investors, if you need a realtor... To sell your properties, you don't just get a kick-ass salesperson when you hire Beth Lowe. You get design, you get the full gap. <laughs> so with that said, Beth, how do people find you? I know you have a couple spaces left on Facebook. <laughs> Everybody rush in because who knows how long it's going to be till next year's cleansing. <laughs> Facebook, you Instagram. Facebook, how Instagram, there's no limit. Realtor Beth Lowe on Instagram, Beth Lowe on Facebook. Um, sure, if you Google me, you can find my phone number. <laughs> Don't stalk me like Charles did. I'll <laughs> those, block you. <laughs> those days are over. Those days are over. If you need plans, if you need permits, you got to call the captain, 516-513-8838. You have a house that smells like cat pee. It's been dated from the 1960s. Land, commercial property, anything real estate related, you know I want to buy it. 516-777-SOLD. That's a wrap. <laughs>